Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Barney Gunderson, who's a nuclear engineer, author, and whistleblower. Thank you for coming. Um, in uh, the 15 minutes, I'd like to share briefly what uh, what I know happened at Fukushima. There's, there's four lessons that I think you can take away based on that experience. Um, the, the first lesson is that nuclear accidents happen frequently. Um, in my career, 40 years in the nuclear industry, there's been five meltdowns. Um, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now three at Fukushima. So if you take 35 years divided by five, you end up with an accident frequency of about once every seven years. Now, the nuclear industry says it's a one in a million chance, but if you take a million in the numerator and 400 power plants, in the, in the denominator, you wind up with an accident frequency of about every 2,500 years. So the numbers the nuclear industry is using to cite nuclear power plants are once every 2,500 years compared to experience, which tells us that nuclear accident is going to happen about once every decade. Um, and I, I think that's a, a serious policy gap. Wherever I go, the policymakers who influence legislation have convinced legislators that this is not going to happen in a lifetime, despite five of having defined professional careers. So point number one is that accidents happen frequently. But point number two is that accidents are getting worse, more severe, not less severe. Three Mile Island was a partial core meltdown. And within a, uh, a year and a half, we, I had people working at Three Mile Island, had got the camera down into the vessel and were able to photograph the, uh, the nuclear core. Um, Chernobyl was a full meltdown, so we went from a partial meltdown to a full meltdown. But again, within a year, the Soviets were able to get underneath the reactor and take a photograph of the nuclear core. So it's called the elephant's foot. If you go up to Google and, and Google elephant's foot, you can see the Chernobyl core, molten blob, kind of gray, it looks like an elephant's foot. And, and now we're at Fukushima with three meltdowns. And the meltdowns are so horrific, we haven't gotten anywhere near the nuclear force to be able to photograph the condition there. So we've gone from a partial meltdown to a full meltdown to a, uh, a triple meltdown. In, uh, in in the 40 years that I've been in the industry. Uh, so frequency is increasing, and the magnitude of the damage is increasing. But the next point is that Fukushima was, was a disaster. It wasn't an accident. So an accident is when you're driving at night and uh, you run the truck on your car and you get it going. Okay, so that's an accident. But, but the Daiichi disaster was created by American engineers at Vasco, which is in Manhattan, and, and, and uh, I was in uh, San Jose, California. This was a design problem that the engineers knew of when they built the plant. And historically, uh, tsunamis as high as 20 meters have hit the Japanese coast, and in fact, in the last 100 years, there was a 28 meter tsunami just south of the, the Daiichi Sun. But then they built the wall four meters high. So I can't call the Daiichi accident an accident. It's a man-made disaster. And as bad as it is, point number three is as bad as Daiichi is, it could have been 14 times to 100 times worse. And the reason for that is this. The, um, the tsunami that was kicked off by the earthquake destroyed Daiichi, but it also destroyed the cooling pumps at Dainini, Fukushima Daini, which is uh, uh, six miles to the south. And it also destroyed the cooling pumps at Anagawa, which is three units, which is about uh, 100 miles to the north. And it also destroyed the cooling pumps at Kutokai. There were 14 reactors that had their cooling pumps destroyed. And it wasn't as if the tsunami took out the diesel generators and destroyed the electricity. 
whether or not the diesels had been built 100 meters high, the disaster would have happened anyway because the tsunami wiped out the cooling plants that were needed to remove the nuclear heat. So what happened there was that at those 14 reactors, there was 27, 37 uh, diesels that were designed to keep those plants cool. 24 of them failed in the tsunami. And that's something you just don't hear about in the media. This was not a problem specific to Daiichi. Daiichi was in trouble for six days. Managawa was in trouble for two days and don't cry for about a week because they couldn't keep the plants cool enough. The worst plants were, were the reactors, the six reactors at Daiichi, but 14 reactors were involved. What saved the day was luck and courage. So we've got this high technology uh, device that low technology is what wound up rescuing the day. And courage, uh, of course, at Daiichi, um, there was the famous Fukushima 50. In fact, there were probably close to 100 people that stayed behind. The risk of life out of, out of love for their, the manager who ran the plant. Um, and they stayed behind and received extraordinary radiation exposures and were able to wrestle the nuclear dragon in the ground. Um, but at Daini, the same problems were happening. And the same at Angawa, the same at Shokan. So we had 14 reactors near meltdown. And um, I believe we'll find that some of the fuel was damaged at one of the Daini reactors as well. But uh, we have three complete meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi. Daiichi, by the way, means one, so it's Fukushima one. The first Fukushima site has six nukes, and Daini means two, Fukushima two, the second Fukushima site, which had four nukes. And at, uh, uh, so between them, there were 10 reactors near Melbourne. Now here's where luck came in. And it's hard to imagine luck in the middle of a nuclear accident. But the key was that it happened during the day on a weekend. If the accident happened at night, or 12 hours later, instead of on a Friday afternoon, if it happened at Saturday morning, instead of a 1,000 people at Daiichi, a 1,000 people at Daini, there would have been 100 people. The infrastructure would have been destroyed and there would not have been enough people to wrestle those nuclear dragons to the ground. So a 12-hour difference in when that earthquake hit and when the tsunami hit meant the difference of the destruction of Japan and likely the total contamination of the Northern Hemisphere. So accidents are happening once a decade. They're getting worse, not better. And the accident the disaster that Fukushima Daiichi could have been a hundred times worse uh, were it not for luck and courage. The fourth point is that of all the technologies available for us to generate electricity, nuclear is unique in that it can destroy the fabric of a country overnight. We have um, uh, Gorbachev, Nikolai Gorbachev, in his memoirs, says that the collapse of the Soviet Union was not due to the Paris it was due to Chernobyl. So we've got a political system that collapsed because of uh, a nuclear accident. Uh, over, the, over the years, I've gotten to know well Neo Khan. And of course, he, was, he had to face the fact that he might have to evacuate Tokyo with 35 million people. And, and relocate them perhaps forever. And then he's basically come to the conclusion that uh, nuclear power and civilization are fundamentally incompatible and is out there campaigning against nuclear power in Europe as well as here in, here in the UK and of course in Japan. So now, now we have Gorbachev, a uh, you know, communist, a communist. I don't want to say dictator, but that's not quite the right word. And then we had on the right, we have Gorbachev, and on the left, we have Khan. But in addition, three other Japanese prime ministers representing the conservative wing 
of the, of the political spectrum in Japan are also against nuclear. And now, of course, we've got Merkel, who was a physicist, who fundamentally flipped on the issue of nuclear power with the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, and has now become against nuclear power. All for the same reasons. They all realize that this is a technology that can destroy the fabric of a country overnight. And you know, it's fundamentally incompatible with, uh, uh, with civilization as, as we know. Uh, the fifth point, and my last point, I think I'm running out of time. My, my fifth point and my last point is that I think if you look back, so, so first point, they're going to happen frequently, once every decade, somewhere on the planet. Second point, they're becoming more severe, not less severe. Third point, it was only luck that made this accident uh, as, uh, as less severe as that's not severe. It was only luck that made this accident that's manageable for the northern hemisphere. And I, I wouldn't even claim it's manageable for Japan. And the fourth point is that this is a technology that can destroy the fabric of the country. The fifth point is that I think a hundred years from now, historians are going to look back on the era we're in now as uh, not about being pro nuclear or being anti nuclear. But my fifth point is that I think a hundred years from now, we're going to see this as a battle between energy parallels. We have, in the 20th century, when I was building nuclear power plants, we had central station power. And it was the only way you could build it at the time. And in the 21st century now, we are heading toward a grid that's distributed, generally. And what that means is many small ways of generating power, we have solar, windmills, et cetera, biomass, and on one but small generating capacity connected to a grid that thinks a smart grid. You know, we have, we've had this experience already. When I did my Nestor's thesis, I needed to go to an IBM 360 computer that was twice as big as this room. It took minutes and minutes to churn the calculations out and cost $2 million. You went to the computer. I have more power now on my laptop for less than a thousand bucks than that two million dollar computer has. So uh, computing has become just your, your phone, cell phone. It used to be that your phone for hardwired into central station. That paradigm has changed. The last domino fall in, in this um, in this revolution generated by, by computing is the paradigm of central station power. And I believe 100 years from now, we will look back on this and say, this wasn't about building an 81,000 in Cumbria or building Hinkley. Hinkley and the 81,000 are symptoms of a much larger battle. And that, that much larger battle is that the energy paradigm is fundamentally changing. So, uh, and that's my good point. And I want to thank you all for, for being here tonight and sharing so much.